We're continuing our conversation with soprano saxophonist and flutist Jane Bunet, who is uh, performing in Amherst with her band Makeke. My name is Glenn Siegel. I'm the founding director of the Magic Triangle Jazz Series, part of the Fine Arts Center at UMass, and uh, we are happy to be producing uh, Jane's show uh, at Balka Auditorium. So Jane, we were just starting to talk about Makeke, and uh, it's such a special project and has really um, started to get its legs, so to speak, five years into this project. Uh, explain a little bit about how it formed and what it is. Okay. What is Makeke, and what does Makeke mean? M okay, good. Uh, well, Makeke um, in the Afro-Cuban dialect translates to fiery energy and spirit of a little girl. Um, there was five names when I was forming the group that um, Daimi Arosena, who helped me put the group together, um, her grandmother is a practitioner in the Afro-Cuban religion, and um, so she has a lot of, a lot of knowledge of um, that particular dialect that's used, which is called Lukumi. And um, she gave me five names, and that one just jumped out at me. Um, to choose from that she thought would be work for a, an all-female ensemble. I asked her, what, what does Makeke mean? And she said, that. And I said, that's the name. Perfect. So when I, when I formed the group, um, um, it came about because for 25-odd years, maybe longer, um, I have co-run a group with my husband, Larry Kramer, called Spirits of Havana, uh, which was founded in 1990 with our first recording that we did in Cuba. And um, I've had many really stellar musicians come through um, when they were, you know, very early on in their careers. One was Daphne Pareto, 17, 18 years old. Um, Jos Vanny Terry was in the group for a bit. Junior Terry. Uh, David Vareles, um, Pedrito Martinez, there's a long list, Lario Duran, Carlitos de Puerto, um, and they all have their own bands now and are doing terrifically well. And um, I was the only woman in the group, pretty much outside of the first recording that we did with Mercedes Valdez, who was the elder, of course, in the, the ensemble. Um, and through our travels and, and work in the conservatories that we have been doing for, for many years in Cuba, um, I kept meeting young women that get pretty much 15 years of musical training, but they do not, uh, once they finish their conservatory years, a lot of them just stop playing. And uh, they might teach, but a lot of them don't go on to performing. And that was kind of discouraging. I would be at a jam session and try it to get the students, you know, that later that afternoon, you know, I've been hanging out with and playing with, and they wouldn't have brought their instrument to the jam session. And I just, I kept talking about it with Larry, and it's like, why, why are none of them playing? You know, I'm the only one who's up there playing. And I know it's hard, you know, because you're kind of, the guys are kind of like, I don't know, they're a bit, bit macho down there. Macho everywhere, actually. And so you have to hold your own. But, um, you know, they weren't being encouraged. And so I was actually kind of at a little bit of a, a stall in my, you know, as a musician, you often plateau and don't, what am I going to, what am I going to do next? I've just done this record. I've just done that record. I've just done this tour. So I was kind of at a standstill. And um, I met Daimi Erosena in Cuba, and I invited her to, to come and play with me at something that I'd organized. And she was phenomenal, and she was, you know, 17 years, 18 years old. And later I brought her back to, I brought her to Toronto to do a show with me. She brought the house down, and that's when the seed was planted. More so by Larry said, well, maybe you should try and organize something with Daimi. We'll go to Cuba and we'll pick out the girls that we want and we'll, we'll form something and this will be the next project. And so it was sort of done as a one-off. I did not expect to really, this thing to, to continue, but 
we made our first record, which was a very difficult record to make. And I didn't have a lot of faith in the project. Uh, I was really, just at this point in my career, really, I guess at a low point, you know. I've had a few of those um, where it's just like, how much longer can I keep doing this? Doing the paperwork for tours, doing the recordings. What does this all mean? It's, does it mean anything? Does anybody really care? <laughs> and um, the record got very well received. And on a kind of a whim, I sent it out across Canada to see if we could make a tour of the group. And we got accepted to many of the jazz festivals. And so that year we made our first tour. And then thought, well, the next thing is let's see if we can try and get into the U.S. And that's where it really took off. I think our first tour in the U.S., the group was really um, well received and, you know, sent a message that people responded to. Um, the girls are all very high energy, creative women. And um, um, the fact that this was always important to me that there was a vocal component to the group because I had made a record with um, a wonderful a cappella group in Camagüey, Cuba called Grupo Vocal Descendant called Embracing Voices. Mm -hmm. And um, I really loved work, working with the, with the voice. I've always kind of a frustrated singer. I wish I could sing, I can't. But um, I wanted to have a vocal component. Uh, so um, five of the girls sang besides playing their instruments really well. And that became a part of our, uh, the, the sound of Mekeke. So we've just continued to, to keep doing that and, and, you know, trying to get more, um, more opportunities to play as a group and more, you know, exposure. And um, now we're starting to, to get some recognition and just finished our third recording. So Great. We're yeah. looking forward to that. That's coming out in the summer? It, it will be coming out in June. Mm -hmm. Great. And uh, at this point, five years into the project, you've had... Uh, a, a couple of uh, women who have been with you for quite some time and then others who sort of circulate in and mm -hmm. out. So how does the uh, recruitment process go? And are you uh, confident that you can find players yeah. of that caliber to continue the project? I think so. Um, you know, I often I try and sort of keep my eye on Facebook and see the names that are like people that are working away. I know nowadays in some ways, it's really, it's much harder nowadays to establish a, and I hate to use the word career, but establish, establish yourself as an artist because there's so much out there and there's a lot of stuff that's not very good, but there's still a lot of really interesting, a lot of people doing really interesting things. And if you kind of keep your feelers out there and, and for example, we're playing, um, uh, Boston in a couple of days and so I've invited some of the women that I know are, that are in the Berkeley program to come to our show and um, I have met some musicians in in that manner that have, have um, gravitated towards us and said I want to play with you guys and I said okay give me your card I'll keep you in mind because you never know mm -hmm. and it happened with a young drummer named um, she's from the Dominican Republic her name's Ivana and um, she filled in for Yissy because Yissy had a, got hired by Dave Matthews' band to go do something. And, and I was like, hey, Dave, you got that. Go for it. And, uh, but just let me get another drummer. And I was able to get her. And she just, she just fit in so beautifully. So mm -hmm. um, trying to constantly just be always keeping your feelers out for um, to be able to extend an opportunity to somebody that's, you know, might give them a boost in some way mm -hmm. to get out there. Yeah, yeah. And tell me about the uh, dynamics of being in an all-women band. Have you noticed? Mm. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and, and I should say, it's <laughs> not only that it's an all-women band, yeah. but they're all of a different generation mm -hmm. than you. Yeah, thanks uh, for pointing that out. <laughs> thanks, Glenn. <laughs> um, Yes, they are. I mean, I can I'm old enough to be, maybe even their grandmothers. No, but uh, yeah, they're all you know in their twenties, and um, I. Um, it's interesting for me because it does. You know, I have to 
uh, keep up my energy. Sometimes I surprise myself by they're really tired and I, I'm the one with the energy that day. But um, we, all, um, we all work really hard and they all just give 100%. You know, when, when we hit the bandstand, there's, uh, there's just a feeling of all of them just, they're so focused and they're so good and um and they love it and and the opportunity we every single concert we get if it's you know if it's like 30,000 or if it's 30 people you know we we try and just give it give it everything we have um because you just uh, you you know you are representing the music the music is that important and you have your own pride you know as a musician to always give it your your best so yeah mm -hmm. and um, I'm curious about this idea Cuba has great music conservatories um, and at some of the events yesterday uh, the women were talking about not being allowed to play their uh, their music mm -hmm. their own cultural mu Afro-Cuban music in the conservatories which were European dominated um, and then on the street there's all this other, other life things happening, um, yeah. and so I'm just wondering about that you know very stark dichotomy mm -hmm. um, uh, it's almost like two sides yes. that don't mix yeah well that's interesting um, because uh, in in some ways um, because of the government has organized support for certain things, certain things prosper and other things not so much. But they still, you know, I think this kind of happens everywhere, but it happens more in Cuba just because the support that certain musical institutions have been granted because of the history of their of the Cuban pride and what the um, when Fidel did come into power of how he um, you know uh, made a shift in supporting the more African aspect of Cuba so that happened with you know groups like the Los Moñiquitos and a rumba group that would have never been given um, the acknowledgement of the government that this music is important and not a mar not a marginalized um, music, but when those things happen, they 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 put it's almost like they put in rules and then the next bu bunch of rules have to be broken again, right? So that's sort of that's how, sort of how things are right now. The Cuban psyches is so strong that things will. Prov Things will always prevail because Cubans are inventors. They're constantly, if the car doesn't work, they will invent something to make that car, you know, get on the road and go. Um, all kinds of things, you know, like that. And, and same with, with the music. But they're, they're frustrations. And um, just the way, that's one of the reasons for starting Mikeke because, um, you know, the performance opportunities in Cuba are even difficult for the male musicians um, and the male musicians gobble up you know the, 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 the musicians that are the people that are always well known tend, tend to get the support and the people not that aren't so well known not so much and this is always a fight everywhere you know um, that's always the top ten you know North America same deal right these are the top ten writers, these are the top ten this. And there's always going to be somebody who's not on that list who's like, this guy's amazing, why is he not on the top ten list, right? So, but this is, this is a frustration, especially uh, our piano player mentioned that because she wants to pursue more of the great Cuban composers. And even though they're talked about in Cuba, Lequan, Cervantes, um, they're they're not you know in the in the schools they're pushing Rimsky Korsakov and they're pushing Brahms and they're pushing those things not as much as their own 
um, because that's the way the the institution has been set up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and mm -hmm. that was partly because a lot of the teachers that they brought were from Europe, that came at one point to to teach in in the schools. A lot of Eastern European, um, you know, when when they were with Russia, a lot of Russian um, musicians came to teach in the conservatory. So that was pushed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, certainly, I mean, the level of musicianship yeah. in the typical Cuban musician it's in the DNA. is off the yeah, charts. Yeah, it's, it's in the DNA. I mean, it's, it's a complicated, you know, the more I keep thinking that I understand the Cuban psyche, the more I keep saying I don't. It's a paradox, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. truly. Yeah. And can you discuss a little bit the role uh, of politics in <laughs> of Cuban politics, mm. which, you know, so people have such strong opinions about, yeah. especially when you travel to Miami or when you're in Cuba, like yeah. how do people think about the revolution and, you well, know. Well, that is changing. That's something I've really observed in, um, I'm, I don't go to Miami a lot, but I know with the younger people now that um, a lot of them have left Cuba. A lot of them now are going back and forth to Cuba a lot of people living outside of Cuba are supporting businesses in Cuba, like private um, paladars, you know, re the restaurants, um, setting their relatives up in, in with a, what they call um, casa particulars, which are um, um, uh, pen, uh, B and B's, mm -hmm. or they might be doing Airbnb too. Um, there's a lot of money coming from Cubans outside of the country back into investing in there. So that was something that you never, you didn't see that 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. So that's and within a the, the dynamics within the band around politics, people have different opinions? No, or? they're pretty much all on the same page. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. uh, even though, for example, one of the musicians is living with Larry and I, partly because she needs to be more exposed to the resources musically that we have, we're able to give her right now because she's um, advancing so quickly in terms of her, her technique and everything. Like I've just where she's gone in one year of living in our, our house. And that's not to say that she can't learn stuff in Cuba, but there's just there's resources that you, you can't get, like materials and recordings and all the things that you need to, to grow as a musician. And um, so she's, you know, she does go back to Cuba, but she's living with us at this time. Um, a few of the other girls, they, they're still very connected to family there, and they go out on tour, they go back with some money, and that money can really stretch them for a while and sustain them. Um, because if you're smart in Cuba, you you can you know how to, to work the system, but it's very very difficult. You know, there's still the rations, there's still um, shortages of like lining up for toothpaste. These these very simple necessities that uh, we take for granted. And you can go to the dollar store and buy you know um, a tube of toothpaste for seventy nine cents. They're lining up at some place because that particular store that day has got toothpaste in, and you're going to pay five bucks for a tube of toothpaste. Oh, yeah. That's a lot of money. That's like a quarter of somebody's salary, possibly. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, we're starting to run out of time, but yeah. I did want to ask you about future projects and uh, musical life beyond Makeke. Mm -hmm. Musical life beyond Makeke. Well, <clears throat> I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm so open to working with so many musicians. Like, I love... I mean, as much as I love Cuban music, I love all kinds of, of music. And I've had the opportunities to work with, you know, some Brazilian musicians and some African musicians, um, some great, you know, modern people that are, you know, right out there developing their incredible um, own sound. I'm just, I just try to be as open as I can to what's happening. Um, and but still try to keep focus on the projects that I'm, you know, trying to keep on the table. So it's really hard to say what 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 could happen. One of the things I'd love to try and do is, um, and it'll be a big big uh, project, but um, a big band, 
with all all women and um they might not all be cuban there might be some like special guests that are out there but it'll still have a cuban um it'll still have that cuban rhythmic thing happening afro cuban rhythm mm -hmm. rhythmic thing yeah, okay that's yeah, what getting I like a to big do. band off the ground that, is, i know uh, i know are you crazy <laughs> <clears throat> mm -hmm. Although I must say, being a Canadian, you have advantages that American musicians don't have I, or access to. I do, yeah. and I would be reaching out to a lot of women in the U.S., I think, that are, that are out there doing some pretty amazing things to be a part of it. So I mm -hmm. would see it like as a really, a real global band, mm -hmm. big band, yeah. Great, great. Well, Jane Burnett, Thank it's been you. a real it's pleasure speaking. to speak with you. Thank I'm you. looking forward to your concert tonight. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.